The views and opinions expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of KLAY or those who advertise their products or services on this station. got a question for you did you pray this week <laughs> no i never pray or were you like us and uh celebrated the national day of reason instead if you'd like to talk to us about that and how kind of ridiculous i think the national day of prayer was give us a call at 253-584-1480 this is ask an atheist my name is sam and with me today is mike how's it going and beth hello all right, so uh, why don't we get right into it? First things first, we're getting down. It's uh, 13 days. We're 13 days. Almost two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Almost, thir almost two weeks to the beginning of the backpedaling. Uh, I actually saw a sign here in Tacoma. Yeah, you were telling us about that. Where is it? Okay, so for those of you, for the, the one of you who might not have noticed this, uh, we are <laughs> counting down to the end of the world, or rather the lack of the end of the world and the backpedaling that begins the day after the world fails to end, which is this month on the 21st. Yeah, Harold Camping, who is this uh, fundamentalist, uh, I guess he's a professional angry man who uh, goes on the radio. He has a company called Family Radio. They're fundamentalist Christians, and this is the second time that he's predicted date and hour of the end of the world. Yeah, I only recently learned this myself, that he's done this before. Yeah, Yeah, he did this in 1994, and I believe that his excuse then was that he forgot to carry a 2 as part of his Da Vinci Code <laughs> calculations. <laughs> um, At least it was an imperial metric conversion or something like that. I don't know. When, when you start with, with basically nonsense, uh, you're going to end up with nonsense. It's, it's kind of silly in, silly out. Sure. Well, in the what we're actually going to do on the day that when the backpedaling ends is have a little bit of a party with live music. So Saturday, May 21st, 2011 at 8 p.m., join us at Dorky's Barcade at 9th and Pacific in Tacoma. We will be having live music, arcade, special events, and other weird media stuff. And with us will be Three Ninjas with Tangent Bot, Lena Lou, and then a jam session with Ask an Atheist Chad Cassidy and possibly other guests. I'm hearing uh, more stuff about that right now. So yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, we've we've done dorkies of her after show events. It's a great place, great food, and plus you can play Pac-Man. Yeah, um, it, it looks like a lot of fun. They're really excited to have us there. Uh, you, you know, we're still kind of getting it down, but you might have seen our posters around town. But uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, and it's only 10 bucks, so it's a pretty cheap, awesome evening. Yeah, $10 at the door. <clears throat> so we have some other emails. Uh, actually, we have a lot of emails today, but yeah. we have some other news about the backpedaling topic. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we should probably start with this email we got from Ryan Young. All right. All right, it says, hey, guys, I'm relatively new to you, listening to your program. And a proud, outspoken atheist in San Antonio, Texas. I listen to your podcast on Monday mornings. I know you've been doing the countdown to backpedaling for quite some time now, and it's all good fun on the show, but it just occurred to me today that there's really a more serious side to this. What about the truly devout who honestly believe with all of their being that they are going to rise up on, to heaven on May 21st. What happens when they, that doesn't happen? Surely the ringleaders of this nonsense will do the backpedaling or rationalizing as you may prefer, but the followers w must feel a certain sort of betrayal when it is all said and done. Um, I, I know this is something that they've, they've mentioned before. And yeah, and we, we talk about this a lot. I mean, we, we have fun with the countdown and we have the clock, but... Honestly, we are concerned about the followers. Yeah, the, there is there is a serious side to this, and I know that NPR had just caught wind of, of this campaign. This is billboards not just around the state, not just around the country, but around the world. There, there's, You have them up in Scandinavia, you have them in Australia, you have them in New Zealand, you have them in Russia. And uh, they actually, uh, NPR managed to catch up with a couple of the people that were leafleting for this. Uh, one of them, uh, Brian Halbert, who's, uh, I believe they said he was 33 years old, he said, I no longer think about 401k and retirement. Uh, I'm not stressed about losing my job, which a lot of people are in this economy. I think I'm just a lot less stressed. In, in fact, uh, in a way, I'm, I'm more carefree. And here's the one that 
that gets even scarier. It's not just the fact that somebody's essentially throwing their financial responsibilities and thinking for the morrow, you know, the opposite of what the Bible tells you to do. Um, it says camping's predictions have also inspired other groups to rally behind the May 21st date. People have quit their jobs and left their families to get the message out. Knowing the date of the end of the world changes all your future plans, says 27-year-old Adrian Martinez. Uh. She thought she'd go to medical school until she began tuning into family radio. She and her husband, Joel, lived and worked in New York, New York City. But a year ago, they decided they wanted to spend their remaining time on Earth with their infant daughter. My mentality was, why are we going to work for more money? It just seemed kind of greedy to me and unnecessary, she said. And her husband adds, God just made it possible. He opened doors. He allowed us to quit our jobs, and we moved. We just moved, and here we are. Now they're in Orlando in a rented house, passing out tracts and reading the Bible. Their daughter is two years old, and their second child is due, child is due in June. Uh, yes. That is awful. Yes. I can't even li- I'm sorry. I can't even listen to it. I don't, I don't understand how this guy can spearhead this sort of of advertising campaign essentially for his own radio show and there are these people who are giving up and she has a baby inside her oh my goodness it gets even worse well, it's there's it, <clears throat> well, go ahead it, it says joel says they're spending the last of their savings they don't see a need for one more dollar uh, you know, you know, you think about retirement and stuff like that. He says, "What's the point of just having money just sitting there? We budgeted everything so that on May 21st we won't have anything left." Yeah, uh, there's a lot I could say here. Uh, the first things first is, I guess, the cynical side of me is saying, "Well, she got out of medical school to do this." That could be, to, to borrow a phrase, a blessing in disguise. Is uh. I'm not really certain I want somebody like that uh, practicing medicine upon my body. However. The other thing is, is uh, you know, sort of speaking to that cynicism, um, a lot of people say that this countdown to backpedaling thing, this, uh, this end of the world thing that Family Radio is doing, there aren't, any, uh, there aren't any innocence in it, that people are choosing to be deluded and people are choosing to, to follow this guy around and spend it's a, It's money. a very P.T. Barnum way of yeah, looking at we it. Yeah, but we just read about two innocent victims right there, didn't we? The fetus and the, ch- the two-year-old. I mean, come on. Uh, 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 sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm actually speechless on this. It really makes me Some, mad. Something I say is, well, you may have the right to screw up your kid's life. It's not necessarily a good idea. No, it's awful. And and what? Uh, that's the thing. I want to ask, what does Harold Camping think about all this? How old is this guy, by the way? Isn't he, like, in the, his 90s almost? Oh, practically. He's he's 89 years old. So is this, like, his last-ditch effort to get a bit of attention and and whatever for his cause? I mean, what exactly? In fact... Didn't we have, we had Bob, um, Bob Seidensticker, a guy who's actually been on the show before, and he uh, tuned into a radio program that Camping was on. Um, I believe it was on Family Radio, actually. And there was a caller that asked him, he said, can we have all of your stuff? And what was Camping's response to that? Wasn't it very... It was very dismissive. Yeah, he said something like, uh, the guy called asked for all of Camping's stuff as of May 22nd. Camping's response was, if you think May 22nd will be business as usual, forget it. Well, given that May 22nd is the day after the party, I know it's not going to be business as usual for me. <laughs> <laughs> so ibuprofen will be used. But I mean, what a non-answer. He's not even actually directly responding to these questions. At least he wasn't there. Maybe he has in, in another place. I'm not sure. I haven't read anything that says that camping's actually directly responding to these very valid questions. Why haven't you sold all of your stuff? Why haven't you liquidated your your assets? Why? What are you doing to prepare for this? And it looks like he, he himself isn't doing anything. And this is why I'm not really certain. Everybody's like, well, at least he's a true believer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I, I still don't, I'm not convinced. The evidence isn't there. If he was a true believer, he would be using everything, he, he and family radio would be using everything they've got to get this message out there. And while some of their followers are using everything they have, as that NPR article, our NPR article specifies, Family Radio and Harold Camping are not. That, that is a good point. I, I will give you that. However, I, I don't, one, I don't see him really profiting from this. I'm not really sure what he gets out of this. I guess. What the, do you mean he's not profiting about it? Before, no one knew about Family Radio. Now it's on, it's on CNN, it's on NPR. I think that he's profiting from it. To be fair, I mean, yeah, he, he gets a lot of attention, but... It's not like he's going to get a lot of good attention. I don't get the impression that this is a Fred Phelps type. I mean, Fred Phelps is somebody who goes around the country who doesn't try to convince anybody. He's not pushing legislation. He's just trying to be a jerk. But 
Fred Phelps is kind of an uh, kind of an outlier. I mean, there's sort of a spectrum here. You can go for negative attention completely, totally, 100%, like Phelps does, or you can be somewhere in the middle. And I think on that spectrum, I think uh, camping is closer to Fred Phelps than he is to say us. Yeah. Well, clearly. Okay. <laughs> I think if, if there's a line in the middle that that is sort of a a separation uh, point. Hey, you I, don't, I'll go on the record right now and say if, if we could pull a stunt that would be get us a lot of kind of weird attention, not necessarily negative attention, I would think about it. I mean, ultimately, I'd probably say no, but I'd think about it. I'll, I'll give you that. I, I'm just saying that I, I don't really see what he could possibly gain other than bad attention. And right. uh, I, I, I guess unless I see something that gives me a piece of positive evidence that he is lying about what he says. I, I do have a tendency to take somebody at their word unless I have counter evidence. Okay, I, I tend to wonder about people's motives. And I guess, and I, I think we won't really know until the backpedaling actually yeah, begins. Yeah, until we get that response, it's all conjecture anyway, but... Now, speaking of stunts... Oh, yeah, what? Uh, speaking of stunts, we actually have another email about this from Norman. And uh, it's, a, it's a short one. And it's, uh, please have your billboard spotters do as I will and tether helium-filled blow-up dolls, the ones with surprised faces. Are there any with billboard. bored faces, though? I mean, <laughs> isn't that the only kind yeah, you can get? I think they are all that, ooh, type, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, maybe bored might be more realistic looking. <laughs> I, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not going to fully endorse this. I just thought the image of it was nice. I, I don't know what the laws are, and, and I'm going to say, you should probably avoid it, but I think it's funny. Yeah, exactly. We're not telling you to do it, but it'd be pretty funny if you did. Yeah, we're kind of marching into <laughs> Terry Randall territory yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. D don't, don't do that. And this is Ask an Atheist. Our phone number is 253-584-1480. Now, do we have other Countdown to Backpedaling news available? or? Uh... Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about David. Um, there's a film festival going on. It's actually in Florida. It's not a local thing. But I wanted to talk about it just for a minute because I think that this kind of stuff is really cool. I think it's awesome when atheists across the country, or when anyone really across the country, get so involved in something that they're interested in, that they're willing to get something like this together. And there was actually a group in Tacoma that had, I, uh, this is what I've heard, attempted to do the same thing, a, a secular or atheist based film festival and they didn't have much luck it's not something that you can easily get a lot of support for at least not in our area and that's you know not right. obviously binding for everybody but this is uh the first annual international free thought film festival is taking place in tampa florida on the weekend of friday the 13th in may dun, dun, dun. um this is a weekend long event the first of its kind in the area and the films are submitted by the filmmakers themselves it's going to um they're going to be such films as The Nature of Existence, Creator of God, A Brain Surgeon's Story, The Evangelist, Revolution, The God Complex, The Third Testament, and Godless. Um, and there are dozens of short films as well. If you're interested in that, check out freethoughtfilmfest.org or email Andrea Steele at Angie Steele at yahoo.com and I'll try to put something up on the website too to have that information for you guys if you're interested but I, yeah check it out I think stuff like this is part of how we get on the map with atheism and free thought and stuff like that it's just the showing that we're a part of the media that we are a part of American public life yeah and, and that there's the interest for it because yeah. that's always the thing in America if you want to get anything done you have to prove that somebody with a wallet is interested in what you're doing that seems to be I mean am I wrong on that or no you know you have to have the money otherwise you're not gonna get the support and I think something like this is really cool I think it's awesome that they actually I, I think it. that's that's largely how a lot of movement has happened in the the struggle for gay rights yeah is that if you looked at a lot of the early uh, gay rights marches you have like 10 people with sometimes wearing masks because they were afraid of the repercussions of being openly gay and nowadays, you look at uh, something like uh, Seattle Pride Fest, right. where you have large corporate sponsors like Microsoft and Budweiser. That is a huge corporate event. That is a huge corporate event. And it's not that there's someone in their CEO uh, office, you know, counting stacks of coins on their desk, and one day their heart grew three sizes. <laughs> Though in some, some cases, people's minds did change. Absolutely. But what ended up happening faster than the mind changes is how quickly the bottom line changes where people realize there's a lot of money in the community and that's the thing is 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 that you know you might be one of those people who's relatively anti-corporate and says the fact that these parades have become corporate events are bad but it's really it's really proof that these movements have the power of the purse and that these movements are successful in a social if not political realm yeah and that uh... 
a corporation that, that is going to want to make money realizes that there is no profit in being bigoted against this group yeah. and that this is actually somebody to court. This is a group that you want their money. You want their, you want to advertise with them. Yeah. And that's a move forward. And I'd like to see something like that happen with atheists where they realize, hey, you know, there's some money in this. This is one step. And I, I, I think the live events we're doing are another step. I mean, we've got the, the countdown to backpedaling and party coming up. But there's other stuff that Ask an Atheist is going to do in, in the uh, South Puget Sound area that you're going to be hearing about in the next few weeks. So. Yeah, I think that that's, it's important, too, because you get that question a lot, especially when you're involved in a group like this or any sort of, you know, meetup group, Seattle Atheist, that sort of thing, is you get that question question of, well, why do you need to talk about it? Why do you need to be perceived in the public? Why do you have to do this? Why can't you just have your beliefs and not gather and not, you know, have these sort of uh, events and, and, and that sort of thing? And the answer is that you want legitimacy. You yeah. want to have some sort of, you want to have some sort of support in the public forum. And the way that you get that support in America at this point is you make yourself known as a profitable group that's worth supporting and you go for it. And I think stuff like this is awesome and it helps us with that. I, I could tell you that in my tenure on the board at uh, Seattle Atheist, demographic information and just numbers on how many atheists they are was very important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, and the other, the other thing to add on to that is at the same time, uh, it's important for us to be vocal. It's important for us to be visible because there are other people out there they're going to talk on our behalf, and they're not going to say nice things. And it's, imp it's important for us to assert ourselves as atheists to, re to correct those misconceptions. Absolutely. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480, and we'll be back in a moment. Join the Ask an Atheist after party at Doyle's Public House. The Ask an Atheist crew will be there at 5 for good beers, food, and you're invited. You'll find a dozen beers on tap, including Stella, Guinness, Smithix Irish Ale, Twisted Thistle IPA, and Fuller's London Porter, as well as dozens of domestic and imported beers and bottles. Join us for good atheist conversation and meet the crew today at 5 at Doyle's, 208 St. Helens Avenue in Tacoma. Are you tired of religious dogma influencing government policy? Do you support the separation of church and state? Then the Secular Coalition for America is your voice in Washington, D.C. The Secular Coalition for America is the only national lobbying organization representing atheists, agnostics, humanists, and other secular Americans in our nation's capital. The Secular Coalition for America speaks out for millions of non-theistic and non-religious Americans who support public policies based on science and reason, not religious bias. Go to secular.org today to sign up for emails and get involved. That's secular.org. You can advertise on Ask an Atheist on the radio, on our website, and in our podcast. People just like you who have the same interests are listening right now, just like you are. And thousands will download this podcast and listen to it later. If you have a product, service, or idea to sell, people here in the Pacific Northwest and people around the world, thousands will hear your message. Let us help you sell your product, service, or idea. Contact us at advertising at askanatheist.tv. That's advertising at askanatheist.tv. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And our topic today is, once again, you guys. We're going to be just responding to your emails. And what, what did we name this one? I think we call this emails the hands of fate. Nope, actually, I'm going to go to emails versus the Aztec mummy. I I don't know. We I don't think there was any <laughs> yeah, consensus on this. Yeah, I like the Aztec this. mummy one. But All right, I'm let's a, go with that one. Okay, mummies. the emails versus is... the Aztec oh, mummy. wait, for just one second, can we can we say happy Mother's Day? To all the mothers out there? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Mother's Day. You guys are in trouble. <laughs> oh, I'm not so much. But... <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, just a quick happy Mother's Day. There you go. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> uh, all right, we'll go right into our email. And our first email is one. Uh, I like reading these. And uh, it's from Shame on Ye from the Internet. And That's goes, the letter U, the by letter the way. The letter U, yeah. And it goes, a, of mine. it goes a bit like this. Wax needs to get a life. Stop the hatred of all things good. And hatred, by the way, is spelled H-A-T-E-T-R-E-D. Yeah. Hate tread. <laughs> it's sort of like the track that hate would leave. A hate um, tread. <laughs> is is Wax like is like Wax needs to get a life? Are, are we Wax? Is that like a slang well, for something? Or? I don't know. I, I first thought looking at this is, is this is clearly a person who has so much. They love God so much they don't even have room in their heart for things like grammar or spell check. Yeah. <laughs> 
the walks, the walks that they're referring to, this actually uh, ties back in with the website, which if any of you guys have any questions you want to ask, you can go to the website at any time, askanatheist.tv, and there's a big red button that says ask a question. This person obviously found it, but on the website, I had written up a really quick history of what was going on in Florida with the Florida atheists, and um, Ellen Beth Walks is one of the people involved, and she recently got arrested after a lot of back and forth with the local government and the sheriff's office. Um, she initially got arrested for impersonating a lawyer, which it's very sketchy as to whether or not that was actually happening. Right. She simply signed her name Esquire, and they're using that as proof. And then she got arrested for making sex noises in her house where a 10-year-old could hear them. Okay, so uh, yes. as far as I know about the impersonating a lawyer bit, it's that she used Esquire at the... Uh, yeah, she signed her name with Esquire after it, which legally you can do that. It's yeah, it's not a protected <laughs> term, uh, and there aren't really protected terms as far as titles go in uh, in the United States. That's like why... Dr. Kent Hovind. Yeah, Dr. Kent Hovind. <laughs> do you hear the scare quotes? Um, the thing is, is this sort of, there's actually a little bit of history with with signing your name Esquire as being proof for um, impersonating a lawyer, but it's always, almost always historically been along with the person actually impersonating a lawyer, actually saying, I'm a lawyer, I'm doing this, or even trying to go into a courtroom. This is the first time that um, anyone's known of that someone's been uh, charged with this, and it's a second degree felony that they've been charged with it uh, for just signing their name Esquire. Okay. And wait, the second time anybody's been charged with it ever? No, it's a second degree felony, and it's the first time that anyone's been charged with that just for signing their name Esquire. Before, it was a combination of things. It was they signed their name with Esquire, and they actually impersonated a lawyer. They went into a law office or whatever. But this is the first time it's happened where it's just her signing her name with that, and she's been arrested. And now... The latest one is the sex noises. Ah, okay. Yeah. And it was in her own home. And yes. And there was some also stuff where somebody was complaining about prayer at the at the. Uh... Yeah, yeah. This follows. Um, there is a complaint that the the city council of Florida of Polk County was um, having a prayer before their uh, meetings, and they were, and they shifted it to right before the meeting started, and then one of the people from that group came in, complained while the prayer was going on, and, which was within their rights, and so one of the council members actually started the meeting so that they could arrest him for, you know. Right, right. That, that kind of reminds me of a traffic uh, ticket that I dealt with years ago, where uh, somebody who went up to speak to the judge preceding me uh, had told a story about how they had been caught uh, driving in the turn lane, and then they spotted a cop. So to make it legal, they quickly made a left-hand turn. This sounds a lot like, oh, okay, I know that I can't bust them for that, so I will start the the, the start the meeting simply so I can bust them for something. Right. But once you start the meeting, if they shut up right away, you can't get them for anything. Right, right. And that's been the question that's been raised throughout this whole, uh, these issues that have come up in Polk County, is that every arrest that has been made with the atheists, there's, it's very questionable as to why they were actually arrested. It seems pretty obvious, um, and again, I don't know all the facts, I'm just going by what I've read and what I what's available to me on the news. Um, it seems like they're, you know, they don't like it that they're making noise, so they're trying to get them in trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, more information about this is available to you at askanatheist.tv. We are Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And uh, I know we have some listeners out in Florida. And if you guys have information about this, I would love to hear about I would love to get sort of a closer first you know first hand yeah of, definitely because so. like i said i'm piecing it together as i go and it's pretty complicated so <laughs> it's a long 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 messy situation but we have another email from darren in tacoma it says not a question just a thought this was funny as a protest of the national day of prayer on Mar uh, may 4th atheist groups are promoting a national day of reason on may 5th in Kansas, they had something called a Reason Fest on the 4th and 5th, and the Westboro Baptist Church, that's Fred Phelps, who's professional internet troll, protested it. I'm not sure if protesting Reason is more funny or scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've already talked about Fred Phelps a little bit today. Uh, 
he's he's you know hey he's a lot of fun to watch I have to admit and uh, if you're somebody who doesn't know who Fred Phelps is this is the guy who shows up at soldiers funerals or the funerals of somebody who's gay or lesbian and basically holds up signs saying that God hated them and that they deserve to die this is someone who's so hated that you can even have both Keith Olbermann and Sean Hannity hating on him. <laughs> so you could say that Fred Phelps is a uniter, not a divider. This is a professional troll. Oh, he is. He, he seems to have no actual goal other than to get somebody's goal, like an internet troll. Right. And a troll is someone that goes onto an internet forum and is intentionally provocative and disruptive. Yeah, and I would also like to say that I've met Darren in Tacoma, despite people telling me otherwise. <laughs> so, <laughs> nothing to do with anything. But uh, I, I think the National Day of Reason and the National Day of Prayer, that is such, I, I mean, we, we'd, we like to say that atheism in the last few years has gotten really far in America and that, and that, we're, getting, and that we're, we're getting somewhere and we're starting to get recognition, but this is a good sign that we've still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, the, I, I think as far as us getting the car going, I think we've felt it rock back and forth on its wheels, Yeah. but I don't think it's really moving yet. I, I found the National Day of... I'll just get this out there. I found the National Day of Prayer, and I find the fact that every legislative session in America opens up with prayer, I find that incredibly insulting. It's offensive, too. Yeah. And it, it comes from a sort of majoritarian arrogance. Right. And I don't, I think that, and this is going back to what we had, you guys had talked about before with, with Christian privilege, mm -hmm. is that I think that somebody who is in a privileged position, i.e. Christians in the United States, yeah. are so used to having a dominant position that they don't even notice when they're using an official venue to push that position on other people. I, in some ways they do know, like, for example, when... Uh, some Hindus came into uh, the legislature, the national legislature, the, the House, a few years ago. And uh, they had uh, staffers or other people come in to view the session and basically scream Bible quotes at them while they were trying to do their thing. So, I, I mean, as much of a fan of ecumenicalism as I am, I still think, you know, even having the Hindu folk in there was a bad idea. It's best to just avoid it. I, I think what, what, what bothers me the most is, this is my weakness, this is my supreme weakness, is that I, d deep down, desperately want to believe that people are reasonable right. and that yeah. if they're put in the right situation like say for instance somebody who pushes their prayers on somebody else uh, through uh, basically a, a public civil uh, you know government meeting they're pushing their prayers at the minute they understand what it feels like that they have that Hindu prayer and they go wow this is actually kind of alienating and I don't like having my government take the side of this you'd like to believe that they're introspective enough that they would go, wow, you know? This is, this is when I start saying, you know, this is the illness of religion, is that it closes your mind to other contexts. Because the rules don't apply to you, because yours is right and theirs is false. Yeah. And I, I want to believe that people are reasonable, and then that little bit of, you know, something goes, boop. I mean, you can't necessarily knock sense into someone, but you can knock some of the stupid out. And the fact that this is even... <laughs> <laughs> and you want to believe that some of the stupid gets knocked out, and they go, you know what? I don't like how this image. feels, and maybe I shouldn't do this to somebody else. Yeah. I just, you know, we, we, we were founded on secular principles. People are allowed to believe what they want, but it is supposed to stay separate from the legislature. It's supposed to stay separate from the process of, of government. And the fact that we open every legislative session with this stuff turns our back on our history. Yeah, and, and it also turns our back on a large portion of our, our populace. Yeah. This government belongs to and represents all of us. That's not just Christians, not just Mormons or Catholics or Buddhists or Jews or Muslims or atheists. It represents all of us. So in effect, it can't take anyone's side. But all is not lost. There's actually a representative. Uh, his name is Pete Stark. And he he recognized the National Day of Reason. Um, uh, this is a, from the congressional record. Mr. Stark says, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Thursday, May 5th, 2011, as the 2011 National Day of Reason. The National Day of Reason, observed by millions of people in this country and around the world since 2003, celebrates the application of reason. So this is, a, this is an official recognition of this within Congress by one of our representatives. That's a good thing. That's, that's actually far better than, than what I've seen uh, politically in a long time. In yeah terms of recognition of this. And so. if, if you don't know, Pete Stark was, was outed, I believe, two years ago mm -hmm. as the only member of the U.S. House of Representatives who doesn't believe in a god. Yeah. Um, now, I don't, 
I, I like that he's pushing this, and I like that he's not running away from the atheist label, but I don't necessarily want an atheist congressman or an atheist president. Um, and that's what, what Stark is pushing, is recognizing that there's the other half to this, that uh, the way that the First Amendment works with the Establishment Clause is that if you present one, you have to present all of them with equal time so that it becomes an educational exercise rather than an evangelical one. Right. And what I find really telling is even though a lot of the legal protections are in place to say you can't fire someone for being an atheist or you can't bar somebody from serving on a jury or an elected office, the mentality that created those laws in the first place is still very much there. It's just, it's, it's this kind of thing. It's, it's the, the praying in the legislature that, that cuts me out of the government. That, yeah. that no, basically, certainly. I hate to use the word, disenfranchises me. It, it's basically telling all the people in that room yeah. that you're not part of this group. We're the real America and we let you live here. Yeah, this is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And I think we need to move on to our next email. Yeah, let's go ahead. <clears throat> let's hit on Christopher from the Internet. The Internet is a very popular place to live. Yeah. Uh, are we hitting on him, <laughs> or are we going to read his email? There's a lot of people who live primarily in uh, All right, the Internet. so it hasn't been long since I became an atheist. Uh, he just became an atheist, and he's having a hard time dealing with it. His basic question is, how does a new atheist begin to live this new life? Um... He's used to organized religion having structure and certain things that he's supposed to do, like study the Bible and go to church. So how would you respond to somebody who's trying to acclimate to a new lifestyle where you don't have those things? Well, I'd, I'd say the first thing to, to recognize, Christopher, is that atheism is not a religion or a philosophy or a worldview. It's, it has ism at the end of it, but atheism, the A is the important part, it's not theism, which basically opens it up to you. Um, this is a responsibility. We don't have doctrines or leaderships. We don't have an authority figure. We don't have a pope. We don't have Pope Dawkins the first. <laughs> um, you have to sort of ask yourself these questions, and you have to go through a long, sometimes painful, but ultimately much more fulfilling process of figuring this stuff out for yourself. Yeah. I mean, again, nobody's, nobody here is trying to be the Archbishop of Atheism, but this is what I like to call the responsibility of atheism, is that once you, you've gotten out from behind dogma and into, into reason and starting for reason for yourself, this is, this, is the hard, this is the hard part. These early days are the hard part, where you have to start making decisions for yourself and have a, have a moral code that is consonant, uh, that is in line with your beliefs uh, as they are, about, the habit, about what they have to do with all of life, not just what God tells you, because yeah. now you know God is not there. There's something really liberating about this, though, because I've, I've met religious people that I've had conversations with. Like, I've talked to somebody about gay rights, and they're spitting stuff out to me that I can tell that they're just repeating from somebody else, and I don't think they've thought about it a lot. And sometimes you can tell that they don't believe the things that are necessarily coming out of their mouth, that they have problems. This is something you don't have to worry about, but the downside slash upside is that you're going to have to figure this stuff out your own. You're going to have to give thought to all of your beliefs. It is liberating, but it is also a responsibility. And, and that's, it's, it is the liberation of responsibility. But that's not to say that you can't reach out. And no. that's not to say that there aren't tons of resources, especially on the Internet, for places where you can go. And you can say, look, I, I just quit being religious. I realize that it's not for me. And now I have this issue. What would you guys do? And there's a lot of that. We do a lot of that where we have issues that pop up and we bounce it off of each other. Everybody, I think, benefits from that sort of social we, circle. We have, to, we have to make responsible choices. And when you are reasonable, you have to base your reason on the evidence. That's what, that's what we are as skeptics, as atheists, as, as secular people. And that does mean reaching out to other people, yes. using sounding boards, not just living inside your own head. Absolutely. We are social creatures. We have to do that. And I'm going to plug uh, Rich's podcast here because this is, this no, is a good, good place plugging. to go. Yeah. Uh, living After Faith. Go ahead and Google it. It's at livingafterfaith.com. I, I believe so. Yeah, is the website. And this is, this is his focus. And this is something Rich and I talk about quite a bit. And this is a good place for it. That is a good place to start, you know, here and there. I mean, he, and he's on here all the time. So, I would say, Christopher... Figure out, and this is, gonna, this is not an easy thing to do. This is something that will take a, lark, a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of thought. But figure out the sort of person that you want to be and then try to be that. Think about everything that you believe. Think about everything that you're considering believing and really, really give it thought. Don't just take it on authority from somebody else, especially a charismatic figure, whether they're religious or an atheist. Yeah. 
Well, okay. I think, I think we need to move on. <laughs> and uh, this guy's not from the Internet. He's from New York, and his oh. name is Ron. Ron. Um, and his, his email goes like this. The people who theorize that Bush was behind, the 9 behind 9 11 are a huge in number, so why don't I hear as many people making fun of them? Politics? <laughs> are people on the left reluctant to do anything that looks like they're defending Bush? I, you know, I don't really know if that number is as huge as it used to be. I think that they, they peaked in 2006, these 9 11 truthers. And I think they've kind of gone downhill. They've, they've been replaced by a lot of, you know, hotter, newer conspiracy theories like birthers and now the deathers, the people who don't believe that Osama bin Laden was really killed. Um, oh, no. 9-11 <laughs> truth, when you really look at it, as far as crazy conspiracies, they're kind of the Macarena, um, where you kind of remember it, and it's kind of embarrassing and funny when you see it appear in a movie, but... I don't think we're really going to talk about them that much. I think people do make fun of them. It's just that it's the same way we don't really make fun of moon landing deniers anymore because it's just not topical. I make fun of them. Me too. I make fun of all of them. But yeah, I don't. I don't know, Ron. I don't know where you're looking. I don't know what sources you're trying to access to get your opinions on this. But almost everyone I know, even people who aren't politically minded, will make fun of a 9/11 truther. And Bush is not always the name that comes up when people even make fun of it. And we've done an episode. I mean, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, exactly. We even did an episode that was completely dedicated to 9/11 truthers. So I don't. I guess I just don't know where you're coming from, Ron. Maybe you should try to find different sources. I'm not sure. I, I think it would be kind of hard to, to to put yourself into a bubble of people that just believe not. You have to be hanging around nothing but conspiracy theorists. I've seen it. It's not pretty. Well, I know, but I mean, if anyone who gets outside of their house once in a while is going to meet, pe meet people who make fun of this stuff, especially if you talk about it to enough people. Well, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think 9-11 truth is kind of like uh, like what I say about atheism, is that when you stop talking about it, it goes away. So people with yeah. really crazy ideas can look re can exist in the world and look not crazy because they're not talking about their particular flavor of crazy. Yeah, and I, and I know that there is a good chunk of people who um, part of their conspiracy with 9-11 is that Bush was behind it. But there's also an equally huge amount of people who think that other people were behind it, the Bilderberg group or whatever. <laughs> so um, even then, you're kind of focusing on one flavor of crazy and a whole menagerie of crazy. So <laughs> that would be my suggestion. Look elsewhere, dude. We, we do like talking about crazy sometimes. <laughs> this is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. Our subject today is emails versus the Aztec mummy, and we will see you in a couple minutes. Join the Ask an Atheist after party at Doyle's Public House. The Ask an Atheist crew will be there at 5 for good beers, food, and you're invited. You'll find a dozen beers on tap, including Stella, Guinness, Smithix Irish Ale, Twisted Thistle IPA, and Fuller's London Porter, as well as dozens of domestic and imported beers and bottles. Join us for good atheist conversation and meet the crew today at 5 at Doyle's, 208 St. Helens Avenue in Tacoma. The Humanists of Washington is the oldest humanist organization in the state and offers a community of free thinkers who educate the public and celebrate life. Come celebrate life with us. Humanists support intellectual freedom and critical thinking and hold that human beings are autonomous centers of moral development. You can become a member of the Humanists of Washington at humanistsofwashington.org. You'll get our quarterly publication, The Secular Humanist Press. Check out meetup.com where you can be part of our monthly Seattle dinner and our Heathens Do It Better breakfast. Humanists of Washington org. Tacoma Telematics wants to help you connect with your clients. We can give you a top-notch web presence. Tacoma Telematics can take your website to the next level and make it an integral part of your business. But that's not all. We can set you up with VoIP, bringing large corporation phone systems capability at mom-and-pop prices. We build intuitive interfaces to help you manage your resources quickly and efficiently. Take advantage of our holistic approach to helping your business succeed through and with technology. At Tacoma Telematics, we are committed to personal and professional integrity, open communication, and long-term relationships. See us at TacomaTelematics.com. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480, and our subject today is emails versus the Aztec mummy. Yes, all right. We're going to go right into Tony. Tony didn't leave us a city that he's from, so we're going to assume the ever-popular Internet. It seems to me that a lot of times when people talk about terrorism, they seem to think that there is only one group at the time to blame for it. 
but I have noticed that people seem to focus specifically on all others than Christianity. So he's basically saying people focus on everything but Christianity when they're talking about terrorism. I mean, I have heard they usually blame Muslims for it. Yes, I can be wrong here. Do not be afraid to tell me I'm wrong. And I was wondering, is that just me or is it really Christianity that seems to never be connected with this stupidity? I wouldn't say that Christianity is never connected with it. I think Christianity has its own terrorist groups. There's like the Lord's Liberation Army in Uganda, which kidnaps children and forces them into armed serv servitude. There's groups like the Hutari who were just arrested. They had a plot to uh, kill a number of uh, police officers. There's abortion clinic bombers. People like the guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Rudolph, Eric Rudolph, was a uh, Christian abortion clinic bomber. He also tried to blow up the 1996 Olympics. There's uh, the guy who shot George Tiller. These guys are all Christians. Uh, they're all motivated by their Christianity, and they're all terrorists. Now, uh, if I was to blame somebody for terrorism, I'd blame the terrorist. Uh, there are people who are brutalized all over the world. Look at the Tibetan monks. Um, they've got an occupation where uh, they're being brutalized and oppressed, yet when it comes time to, to hurt them to hurt somebody, they generally hurt themselves. Um, I think that you really can't separate somebody's religious beliefs from their terrorism, particularly when their terrorism seems to be an expression of those said beliefs. Well, now, if Tony... See, this is the thing. When I read this, I think that Tony may be talking about how our media portrays terrorists, and in that respect, oh yeah, they focus on Muslims. Why? Because the United States is in, an, uh, is, is in a recession, or the, the economy is bad in the United States right now, and historically when that happens, our governments, and this has happened all the way back, have picked groups, usually they're immigrant groups, to demonize, and that tends to make all of us other Americans feel better. I think that might be a good, <sighs> uh, a good understanding for the sort of the immigration debate that we're facing right oh, yeah. now. Um, like the laws passed in Oklahoma and Arizona where you must have citizenship in order to receive an education, which is a, a terrifying prospect it's to me. It's terrible, ways. yeah. But uh, um, for secular reasons. And, uh, <laughs> but, oh, well, uh, yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, I, I, but I, I think you can't separate the religion from there. Where, where somebody explicitly notes that they're being moved by their religion to do something like al-qaeda is a faith-based organization yeah you can't separate the um allah from al-qaeda and have it be even close to being the same organization that the reason that you can say oh well it's just a political organization religious groups are helplessly and inevitably political it doesn't really matter what your religious group is it doesn't matter if you were the quakers your religious beliefs inform your actions. Your beliefs, period, inform your actions. And like we were talking earlier today about people who, because of their set of beliefs, were putting themselves and their children in financial danger. Yeah. That if you accept certain premises, it's not unreasonable to think that certain actions or, con or consequences are going to come about. Yeah. And what I was going to get to before was... Uh, while we have a lot of examples of Christian terrorism, and I'm not afraid to call it Christian terrorism, the political and social climate in this country right now is uh, tones it down for a lot of the reasons that we talked about in the last part of the show. I mean, every, almost every legislative sh session starts out with a Christian prayer or yeah. a, a vaguely Christian-sounding prayer, if you will. So I would say, Tony, that what you're observing is an excellent example of Christian privilege within the United States. We are a largely Christian nation, so we're not going to talk that much about... Well, Christian about, majority nation. Well, we're not going to talk that much about when the people in that that group do terrible things. Yeah, and I, I want to make, make it clear to, to you, if, if you're somebody who's going, oh my God, he's saying horrible, these people are saying these horrible things about all Christians, that's not what we're talking about. No, no, about. no, not yeah. at all. Um, like, for instance, go into any prison, and I can guarantee you that you're going to see the same kind of numbers uh, for Christians that you see in the general population. Very, very small number of those people, those Christians in prison for violent crimes, are in there for any reason that has anything to do with their Christianity. Yeah. Some are, but I think that motivation is, is the primary cause here. You can't separate Osama bin Laden's need to create sort of a regional theocracy in the Middle East from the tactics that he uses or the book that he has, which basically lauds martyrdom and jihad. Yeah. And it's the same way with, with Christianity and people who favor a foreign policy that seems to be based on the idea that the end of the world is a glorious thing. 
Yeah, yeah, and we are going to be talking about that. And uh, as they say on Good Eats, that's another show. We have sort of a phone call for you, uh, for you right now. He couldn't actually get on the line with us, but he does have a question that I think Mike will love to answer. <laughs> uh, this is Dennis from Oregon, and he asks: Are there militant atheist groups akin to fundamentalist Christian groups? If there are, I've never heard of one. And th th again, we were talking. We had an episode about you know so-called militant atheism, that a a militant Christian is somebody who blows up in an abortion clinic and shoots a doctor. A militant Muslim is somebody who flies a, flies a plane into a building or cuts off a, an infidel's head. A militant Christian is somebody who writes a book and gives a lecture and leaves a lot of hurt feelings in atheist? his wake. Militant atheist. Militant atheist is Thank somebody you. who hurts feelings. So, like the, the question I have about you know what possible harm a person can do is to is to ask yourself this: What would happen if you let someone to their own devices and didn't counter them? If you left uh, Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins to their own devices? They would leave a lot of hurt feelings in their wake. They would write a book, but wouldn't it be better? If the worst thing you can say about Osama bin Laden is that he hurt a lot of feelings with a book or a lecture that he gave, do you really think that these two things are even vaguely comparable? <laughs> Where somebody is actively killing or using uh, force or the threat of force or you know just outright violence and oppression on somebody to get their way ideologically versus somebody who may, you know, if you really look at it, isn't even as mean as uh, Simon Cowell. Yeah. From American Idol, <laughs> and that's uh, and this is somewhere where we kind of diverge. Is that um, you? You tend to think that uh, the possibility for a militant atheist group is relatively unlikely. Well, I'm not saying that it's milit it's unlikely. What I'm saying is that it hasn't manifested. I'm not saying that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I know we can agree on this: is that it's a lot harder to I, I guess if you take a take a, a point of view and, and treat it like it's a it's a rag soaked in water. Uh, it's easier to twist water out of some rags than others. Yeah. That when you have an ideology where you really believe that you are justified in everything you do, including some really horrible things, because the creator of the universe, who is a person who writes all moral laws, is on your side. And my, my sort of response to that is uh, uh, mental illness knows no ideology. That is true. Yeah. Um, but no, I, think I agree with you. My, my, I guess the, the way I would respond there is that um, mental illness often is indistinguishable from uh, religious ideology until it goes too far. And then sometimes somebody doesn't necessarily need to be um, mentally ill. Somebody can be perfectly sane. Like, I don't think Osama bin Laden was insane. Yeah. I think he was. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he just had no problem with it. I I think he knew exactly what he was doing, and he was insane. I I I I, 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 I find it difficult to believe that somebody would con contemplate death on that scale, and not have and not have the empathy to realize the kind of effects they're going to have. Oh, I think he did. I just think he's absolutely morally bankrupt. Mm, I it, think if you have enough, if you can, I think if you can separate yourself enough from what you're doing then anything is possible yeah. that's what i think i think that and people like that i think have the incredible ability maybe it's sociopathic tendencies i don't know um and that would be mental illness obviously but i think that you have to separate yourself from that because otherwise it's so horrific i just can't imagine it, it working otherwise but the, the line blurs <laughs> that's so me. i don't know <laughs> <laughs> the line blurs so much and that's the thing that like remember we talked a couple of weeks ago about this kid who walked up to an ask an atheist booth and actually impaled his hand with oh, a pen yeah. awful. to prove that a god exists. Until that point that he actually stabbed himself, there is no way to tell the difference between him and somebody who's just cuckoo for cocoa. You could say that about somebody who is secular but believes in a conspiracy theory. I mean, Absolutely. That, that is, this is why I stick to the two-word definition of atheism, is that there's, the, again, mental illness knows no ideology. Yeah, is definitely. Mental illness can, or, you know, ideology can mask mental illness, but it is not usually the source of mental illness as far as psychology can tell us, it can assist, it can mask, it can give direction, but it does not cause. And uh, that's, uh, you know, I, maybe I should get some research together to show that one. <laughs> that would off. be good. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I am, think we're coming up with a good episode. Topic. I think we might be. Uh, our next email uh, comes to us from somebody who's uh, contacted us before, and it's uh, Andrew from Australia, and he writes... And this goes back to our politics episode. Uh, I was just going to point out something cool. Australia's Prime Minister, Ju uh, Julia Gil Gillard, Gillard. Gillard yeah. uh, addressed the joint meeting of Congress. Also, interesting fact, she is an atheist, an out atheist. Just thought I'd point that out. Thanks, guys. Great show. And what was interesting to me is we also got feedback on that on YouTube. 
and a lot of people didn't care for her. Yeah, a lot of people are angry at her, I think, because they think of her as someone who's far too accommodating yeah, to that's what I've heard fundamentalist too. Christianity in She's her country. She's been labeled as an accommodation. Yeah, definitely. That, that it's not a country that I don't think has as politically strong a wing of Christian fundamentalism, but there are Christian fundamentalist parties, like the Family First Party, right. is strictly a political party that runs on Christian social uh, conservatism. Is that here or is that there? That's there, the Family First Party. They even have senators down there. And there is such a party here as well, but it's a third party that doesn't get a lot of attention. Yeah, the, the Constitution Party. Yes. They are very much sort of a Buchananite uh, oh. culture warrior party. <laughs> Not good. Basically the people that, that get really angry because of the gays and... Uh, Buchananite. At the sky. Buchananite is a mineral discovered digging in dog parks. <laughs> I, I believe this is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. Uh, oh, I thought it was the only mineral on Earth that could kill Pat, you, yeah, Pat Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like mine. Uh, <laughs> I would say that he was rocketed here from Earth, but that would make him an immigrant. <laughs> if I rem uh, <laughs> Ouch. Uh, I also seem to remember people uh, not caring for the current Prime Minister of Australia because she... Uh, accommodated the Christians specifically on gay marriage. Yeah, he, she had taken that really kind of harsh stance. I And we've, we've said this before. This is a challenge I know you threw out, Sam, and I have yet to hear an answer back on this. I cannot think, and I know that you can't think, of a secular reason that somebody could have for opposing same-sex marriage. I just don't see it, that every reason I've ever seen, that if you dig down deep enough and you ask enough follow-up questions, you always end up getting to religion. Let me, let, me, let me hone that one down a little bit. I have now heard a secular reason for, uh, for against gay marriage, but I have not heard a secular reason against gay marriage that did not apply to the entire institution of marriage. Oh, yeah. That, the other one, too, is I know that people have thrown out one is the ick factor. Right. And yeah, that's what I've heard. I've heard that from atheists, that they don't, know, they don't support gay marriage because it's icky. And here's why I think that's a, that's a red herring, <laughs> is that the ick factor isn't applied universally. That right. It isn't like, there are plenty of things that I think we can all agree are pretty icky, like uh, uh, those plastic croc shoes. ICP fans. ICP fans, juggalos. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our hat is in the ring. I'm going to say that, uh, <laughs> that, fur, that uh, furries... Furries ick me out. Right. That oh, I don't yeah. care if they're, they're like a protected class 20 years from now and that, you know, furries are socially accepted. I will be the Jesse Helms of furries. I don't care. Wow. Um, are you going to vote against civil rights? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to run on some <laughs> wow. sort of like anti-furry segregationist platform, but um, it's it's one of those things where I, I'm icked out by it, but I'm not trying to make it illegal. I mean, yeah, for each Yeah, that's the own. whole point. I'm grossed out by ICP fans, but I'm not going to make it so that they can't vote or do whatever. This I'm is, just going to have my personal opinion. This is one of those situations where I think a lot of our listeners might not know who ICP or, or the furries are, and I don't really want to tell them. If no, you're no. curious, please just look on the internet yeah, and Google don't blame it, me. but I'm not going to spread it. Yeah, no. just... just Type it into Google and get ready to click that little red X in the bop right corner and just it'll never burn out of your brain. And do, I'm warning you now so I will not apologize later. Do yourself a favor and turn safe search on if it's not already on. <laughs> We've got one more email and uh, this is uh, a regular for ours, for us. Uh, this is Donovan in Mobile, Alabama. And he writes, have you ever covered the subject of dominionism, those who are actively promoting the establishment of Christian theology and the fact that there are a thankfully few promoters of it in Congress? I think it would make an interesting subject. Yeah, this is this something come up. I don't know if you've heard of dominionism or Christian reconstructionism. It's, there, there's two kinds of, school of schools of thought on it, and if you want to call it a school of thought. But it's one that either we've always been a Christian theocracy and that we were created from the beginning to be a Christian nation and that our founders were all fundamentalist Christian or that we should be made a Christian theocracy. And that's, yeah, that's the one sort of difference of opinion. You get people like David Barton. Yeah, I was going to say David Barton, that's his big thing. And he's actually gotten pretty popular lately with his revision of what our government was supposed to be. And if you're not familiar with David Barton, he's a fundamentalist preacher who, I guess you could say moonlights as a fake historian. That, uh, and again, this is something you guys should be incredibly skeptical of, is if somebody is a theologian or evangelical preacher first, and a historian or an archaeologist or a paleontologist second, that that should be really your primary job, that really when it comes to the sciences, facts transcend ideology. Mm -hmm. That you're never going to find somebody who buys into the nonsense conspiracy, you know, alternate history claims that the Mormon church puts out, 
from somebody who's not a Mormon. Right. You're not going to see that anywhere. But the beauty of something like, say, physics is that a Muslim physicist and a Christian physicist and an atheist physicist are going to come to the same conclusions. If they go by the evidence. If you follow the method and you, and you treat it with respect. And, well, as a direct answer to your question, are we going to cover Christian dominionism? Yes. Yes, we will. A lot. <laughs> and uh, I think fighting Christian dominionism in some ways has been an uphill battle since the 20th century, since we now have, you know, God on the money, God in the pledge. We have a pledge, and God is in it. And every legislative session opens up with a prayer. Is, is dominionism, while there aren't many people in politics today who are specifically dominionists, it's, it, it is an effect of Christian privilege, once again, is that these, these religious practices in a secular government are sort of the Christianization in America in progress. But they've been so used to having their way uninterrupted for so long that when the scales are balanced and we sort of reset this so that it's fair, they actually have the nerve to pretend that they're being persecuted in some way. Yeah. And that's one of the things, too, is uh, talking to, to our listeners who um, they might question, well, why, why are you upset that God's on the money? It's not that big of a deal. The problem is that if you take a step back and you look at the total actions of these groups, they're using that as a reason to validate other uh, legislation, such as, you know, maybe making it okay to teach Christianity in schools, public schools, <clears throat> things like that. So it might seem like these petty fights that atheist groups are fighting and why can't they just stop? Why aren't they doing something more important? The point is is that these things have become important. They become important because of other people's, other groups' reliance on them as an example of the United States actually being a Christian nation. Right. And uh, I think we're sort of approaching the end of our day. <laughs> it's been a, <laughs> been a pretty eventful one and covered a lot of topics. Yeah. Uh, our Cast and crew today is I am Sam Mulvey, and my hosts were Beth Lehman. Hey. Hello. And Mike Gillis. How's it going? A, our call screener was Rebecca Friedman, and our in studio cheerleader was uh, Melissa, Melissa Dorenkamp. Yeah, that's my mom. Yeah. Hey. Way for, to go for, for giving birth to me. <laughs> <laughs> for It Is Mother's Day, Ask an Atheist is a production of NEDM Media. You can visit us online at askanatheist.tv. Uh, you can give us a call during the show or after the show at our voicemail line at 206 420 And one of those things, one thing I wanted to say to people, um, as you read our site, we're constantly trying to find different things to talk about, different things to comment on. So please take advantage of that Ask a Question button. If you even see some sort of news story that you'd like us to comment on, send it our way and we'll take a look at it, definitely. The shiny candy-like button? The candy-colored button. Who was that? Was that a Kate that liked that? Yeah, that You're was welcome. one of the Kates. Yeah, You're welcome, I, lady. I, I kind of like that button myself. <laughs> Again, this is Ask an Atheist. Thanks you, thank you guys very much, and we will see you at Doyle's.